All right, Revelation chapter 2. Turn your Bible there. Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> I've been a little stuffy this week and a little hoarse. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2. Um, let's see here. We're dealing with, I want to be sure and get the context. Uh, the church of Smyrna in verse 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Uh, something to notice that Jesus introduces himself a different way to each of the churches. Does that mean he's a different Jesus to different churches? No, he's the same Jesus. He is all of these things, all seven of these things that he identifies himself with. He is all of these. It's just like the Old Testament offices. There was a prophet, there was a priest, there was a judge, there was a king, there was a messenger. And Jesus always fills the top role of each one of those. In the New Testament, you have bishop, you have shepherd, you have apostle. Um, and Jesus is the chief apostle. He is the chief shepherd. He is the chief bishop. He is the head of e every office in, that you can find in the Bible that God ordains. Jesus is the numero uno of each one of them. And so even though he's identified different ways to different people, he is still the same Jesus to each one of us. And um, some people like to dissect and separate the Bible out and say this part, this, this part goes over here to these people sitting over here. And this part goes over here to these people sitting over here. And what he said to this guy doesn't mount to a hill of beans to what he's saying over here. And I don't believe that. We got the whole Bible in front of us. 66 books, 1189 chapters. And every one of them, I think, speaks to us who are living in this day right now. So he says then. In verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation. Certainly, some, some churches go through much tribulation. Some churches, not much, but tribulation comes to all. And poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I got a lot of comments on last Sunday's Sunday school lesson. All favorable. Some said it was the best lesson I've ever taught. So I feel like sitting down today and just not doing Sunday school. You know, because once you hit that 70th home run, what is there? What, yeah, well, I'm going to Disney World now. What is, you know, what is there left? I don't have any more good lessons after last Sunday. So um, fear none of those things. Verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Have you ever suffered? Never. <laughs> you ever lied? Yeah, you will, you will, you have, and you will. And if you ever think that you're going, you're going to be the one that escapes suffering, no matter, no matter what you do for the Lord, if you are his, you are going to suffer. And as a young, young, skinny preacher, Years ago, starting out, I was having so much fun with it, and I thought, I don't know what happens to some preachers, why they're so miserable all the time. They must be doing it wrong. And God showed me, took me down the road of suffering and dealing with loss and dealing with failure in the ministry, dealing with sin in the ministry, dealing with everything that every other person pastor minister bishop shepherd has dealt with and it's just a matter of time it'll show up the devil loves to devour things amen that belong to god and so he says fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days we talked a little bit about tribulation be thou faithful how long unto death and I have, I have known people, I have read some of their comments. One preacher 
I've never met him, but I know of him, said that he believes that he has eternal security so much that he could take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. And I'm going, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Because that's exactly what that kind of statement is. It is saying, I can do whatever I want to do, no matter how bad, how wicked, how evil, and God still has to take me to heaven. I've seen them make statements like that. I've read statements, comments on Facebook, posts on Facebook, where guys would say, I believe in eternal salvation so much i believe that if i only believed it for 15 minutes and left it i'm eternally secure and i'm going to heaven no matter what i do and i'm going that is not what the bible says that is that shows your ignorance that doesn't show your knowledge it shows your ignorance of the word of god and and what they'll do is where he says be thou faithful unto death they'll say well he didn't say that to us he said that to the church of smyrna But he didn't say that to us, so it doesn't apply to us. So we don't have to be faithful unto death. You missed one. You missed one. Get ready for another cloud of dust. Like I say, we have them. There he is in that window right there. We have them. We don't know where they come from. I guess the the entrance to the bottomless pit is here in this church somewhere. See, that was dust free. How come you can't do that? Anyway, yeah, he's a man. That's true. (laughs) Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And I I could, I I may dwell on it, may think about it this week, and just teach you the doctrine of faithfulness unto death. Don't quit, don't stop, don't get off, don't leave, keep going. Um. He does not ask us to be perfect unto death. That is impossible. It is not possible for any of us to achieve God's righteousness or God's perfection in this lifetime. But it is possible to be faithful until the day you die. When our ancestors were being tied to a stake to be burnt alive, they were faithful. And... You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe my hope and prayer is that God just intervenes in their life and holds them secure. Remember, we are the elect. That means God has elected us. It is not so much our holding on to his hand as as it is his holding on to ours. Jesus already knows who will be faithful unto death. And he said, I will give thee a crown of life. That is everlasting life uh, in eternity. And then he says, He that hath an ear to hear, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh, which goes with, be thou faithful unto death. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What is the second death? How long does it last? Um, who goes there? And what is it? Does anybody know? Huh? The lake of fire. It is. The lake of fire is defined in the Bible. We'll see that as the second death. Um, And I want you to think of this concept. Um, And Pat Boone sang a song called Everybody Dies. And Tim and Al used to play it uh, when they had their radio program here in St. Louis. And it's a great song. Everybody dies, everybody dies. And the lyrics are, uh, born twice, just die once. Born once, you must die twice. And he's right. Born once, you'll die twice. Born twice, you'll only die once. Okay? So the second death is reserved. If, If I could explain it like this. There is a first resurrection. The first resurrection is the resurrection, number one, of all the dead in Christ, all the dead saints, going all the way back to the beginning. They are resurrected from the grave, from the sea, wherever they are. No matter how bad to dust they have turned, 
They're still here. And God will resurrect them. He then will call those who are alive and remain up together with them to meet Jesus in the air, in the clouds. So shall we all ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's the first resurrection. The second resurrection mentioned in the book of Revelation <clears throat> is what we call the revelation of the damned. The revelation of the damned is a, the second resurrection where at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ, God calls up everybody else. Everybody who hasn't died in faith. Everybody who hasn't served God. He will call them up and give them a resurrection body, a new body. This body, this body here can be burned into nothing. The second body cannot be, and that's the difference. It's like this body can only live so long and its life is temporary. The second body that I will inherit will live for eternity. It will live in knowing, it'll live in awake, being awake. We will be conscious. We will be aware of our surroundings. We'll be upright, taking in nourishment. In other words, we will be alive for all of eternity. Likewise, the word death to us implies a finality of thought, a finality of consciousness, a, fi a finality of awareness. That only applies to the first body, the body you were born with on this earth. The resurrection body that they will receive at the end of time is an everlasting body that will receive everlasting punishment and everlasting torment. So the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, which by the way is supported by the New King James Version of the Bible, because out of 54 times that our King James has the word hell in it, 22 times the translators of the New King James took out the word hell and replaced it with either the grave, which is exactly what Jehovah's Witness believe. That you die and go into the grave and become unknowing. You just, you're, you are totally dead, not aware, not conscious of your surroundings, not aware of any pain or corruption or torment or anything like that. You simply go to the grave. They replace it with the grave. They replace it with a word Sheol in the Old Testament and the word Hades in the New Testament. Yes. I know who you have, are you talk, who you're talking about. You have to, you have to pray for people. I, I've been on the other side and I was talked about. I know it was, and I hated the other side. The other side hated me. And I'm like Paul on the road to Damascus. I got turned around and now I believe it. You cannot change. Don't ask me if, if you can, if you can change my life insurance policy, my health insurance policy. Don't ask me if you can change the title to my house, the title of my car. Don't ask, don't ask me if you can change my DNA. Don't ask me if you can change 
um, any contract that I'm under, don't ask me if you can just update the language to it because I will balk every time. I want to know what you're changing it to and I want to know why you're changing it. Okay? And um, we're living in a, in a time where now the change that took place some 40, 50 years ago with the NIV, now we're seeing the fruit of that change. And it's not good fruit. It is not. So anyway, um, so the second body that will be resurrected in the second resurrection is a body that is to be damned and tormented for all of eternity. Revelation 20, verse 6. I uh, have it up on the screen. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. So we know now what the first resurrection is. It is the resurrection of those who believed from the beginning on till whenever Christ appears in the air. That's the first resurrection. We call it the rapture, the translation, being caught up. But it is the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power. So if you are, if you find yourself flying through the air one day without a plane, without a parachute. <clears throat> um, you either on your way to hit the ground very hard or you're on your way to meet Jesus. And if that's the case, amen, praise the Lord. You do not have to worry about the second death because you've already been judged as being righteous, having the righteousness of Christ. The second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. Um, we'll be judges. The Bible says we'll be judging angels. We'll be priests performing spiritual sacrifices. And shall reign with him a thousand years. So that's us. If we are caught up in the first resurrection, in the translation, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, other verses... We are going to reign with Christ a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, that will be the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 20, verse 14. Death and hell. So, what is the difference? It says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So, what is the difference between hell and the lake of fire? Who can tell me? Huh? Okay. Think of hell as you got arrested and charged with a crime and they put you in the county jail. Huh? Um, not really. Because Catholic purgatory is an actual, it's an in-between place between hell and heaven and the Catholic purgatory says that you can be punished in purgatory and then be purged, hence the word purgatory. You can be purged of remaining sin so that you can then ascend to be with the saints in heaven. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So that's fake news. And no mention of that in the scriptures anywhere. There is an obscure, I think there's an obscure mention in the apocrypha somewhere uh but it's it's a basically it's a way for the the church to get money out of people because they'll tell you hey listen your daddy died uh he didn't have the last rites performed or something some nonsense like that reg said that he knew a family the priest went to the son had three sons in that family hitting them all up for 30 grand a piece 30 grand a piece out of those three sons to pray their daddy out of purgatory. $90,000 the church was going to inherit out of their inheritance. Two of the sons were going to cough it up. The third son, he used some colorful language, but he said, let the guy burn. That's what he said. And, uh, but hell is the holding place of those charged awaiting trial okay and is the county jail punishment yes because if you are sentenced they will often take your sentencing from when the day you were first incarcerated the day you were first arrested and count that as part of your term so it is punishment and think of it like this david in 
before Christ died, in the heart of the earth, there were two places. One was hell fire. The other was Abraham's bosom is the name of the place. Jesus told us that in Luke 16. Because that's where Lazarus went when he died was to a place of comfort because the bosom is always a place of comfort. He goes to a place of comfort. He's not being tortured. He's not being terrorized. He's not being burned. He is in comfort, although he is not in heaven. And so, and there is a, and there's a clear difference because obviously the rich man has access to no water and he is in torments in pain, but Lazarus is in comfort with Father Abraham. And apparently he has access to water. Because the rich man says, have Lazarus dip his water, finger in water and cool my tongue. And Abraham said, of course, we can't because there's a great gulf between you and I. We can't, we can't cross over. You can't come over here. We can't come over there. And so Jesus, when he died, the Bible says he went to preach to spirits in prison and he set captivity free. So he sets those who are bound in Abraham's bosom and they are in heaven now. Uh, those who are, were in hell, in hell fire at that time, are still in hell fire. Um, think of the baker and the butler. The story of the baker and the butler in Genesis 40. Because you have both men who have a dream. One man is lifted up and he is restored to the right hand of Pharaoh. The other man... He is told, you got to wait here, but there's t coming a time when you will be brought out, but then you're going to be hanging from a tree. You're going to be cursed forever. That was the butler. So when Christ died, he set captivity free, all of those in Abraham's bosom, now ascending with him into paradise. Those who were in hellfire are still there to this day. The rich man is still there to this day. So is Korah, who reviled Moses and said, who do you think you are um, being the boss? You're not the only one. And he rose up against, this is called the gainsaying of Korah. He rose up, the ground opened up, swallowed him and 250 people up with him. And everybody else said, Moses, we're on your side, remember? We've always been with you, Moses. Okay. And that was done for a reason. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. Once you see that, you're going, I don't want that. Okay, so that's the difference. So um, hell and death, the first death, are all cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the question then is, is the second death, are you alive? Are you conscious? I don't, I can't use the word alive. But are you knowing and conscious of your torment. Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, so there's eight, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, again, some believe in the annihilation theory, which means that once they're thrown in there, they are annihilated. They are completely wiped out and there is no knowing of any punishment for eternity afterward. Okay, but that is not correct. Jude said this. And I want you to think about what he's saying here. Can a person be born twice? Yes. Even down here, we are now considered as being born again. But we have not yet seen, we're called sons of God, but we have not seen the body that comes with being a son of God. We haven't had that transformation yet. Are there people here on earth right now? I mean, obviously, yes, because it says here in Jude that they're twice dead. That means that they are still living on this earth. But they have reached a point at which they are reprobate. No way, no how, 
Will they ever be a, uh, a candidate for being born again? They have crossed a line with God. And they have become so reprobate in their mind and in their conscience. Their conscience is defiled. They're, it's seared with a hot iron, meaning that nothing that they do bothers them. They have no guilt. They have no shame. They have nothing. They have nothing but sin on their mind and the satisfaction of the lust of the body. Jude said, these are spots in your feast of charity. He's talking about the false teachers. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. It means their conscience is not defiled at all. Clouds they are without water. Carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. What happens to a fruit tree that withers and produces no fruit? It's cut down, cast into the fire. Twice dead. Which means that they are already headed for the lake of fire. They've already been judged by God. I would... Number one, you wouldn't know it if you were. If you were already twice dead, you wouldn't know it if you were. You wouldn't know it. But the fact that sometimes we fear God and we fear the consequences of our sin tells us that we still have a conscience and that the Holy Ghost can lay guilt upon our soul. And we can say, God, I, I can't bear this anymore. Psalm 32 comes into mind. God, I can't bear this sin anymore. God, forgive me. God, for, take away my sins. David said, uh, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51. But those who are already living on this earth and are already twice dead have no conscience about their sins. And they are going to die once and they're going to die twice. And it's already been written down Judge to sign the order, it's over with. And I think in 1 Peter, that Peter is alluding to this when he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Jesus taught us that if a tree is grown up from corruptible seed, it bears what? Corruptible fruit. And is it possible... For a corrupt tree to bring forth good fruit? The answer is no. There was a man out at Richwoods. Um, the guy that called in, used to call in the cattle and the girls would do it. He had a pear tree right next to his driveway and it was over in his pasture a little bit. And I said, man, I love pears. He said, you wouldn't know. I said, why not? He said, that tree's been on this farm as long as I have. And he said, it's never produced a good pear. And he shook the tree and I picked one of them up. And I mean, they were all mangled. And he said, they're absolutely good, no good. Now the cows love them. And as he was shaking that tree, here they come. They heard them pears drop and they come over and they'd eat them pears. And he said, that tree has never produced good pears and it never will. He said, I've never gotten a good pear from that tree ever. And that's the lesson that Jesus is teaching. I think Peter's alluding to it here that... I believe what's coming in this world as they start talking about transhumanism, as they start talking about changing your DNA, altering your DNA, I believe that a transformation is coming to every human being on this planet and it is going to alter them irreversibly. They're, it, just like we are born again to salva salvation, they are born again to Per, to a perfect corrupt state where they will be twice dead. Um, turn to Matthew 23. Yes. Right. Exactly. Hold out hope for everybody, but not everybody's going. And this is how it's done. Matthew 23, uh, Matthew 23, number 23 is the number for death. And in Matthew 23, he talks about whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Okay. St. Peter's Basilica. I was doing a little research yesterday on that. St. Peter's Basilica 
which is where the high mass is performed in the Vatican. It's that huge, huge building. Where, they, where, the, where the Pope says his mass is from a stage that they call the Baldacchino. It has four twisted columns on it and a big roof over it. And he says mass standing at this exact spot. Now, can he move over to the left about 20 feet or to the right? No. He must say the mass at this spot. Because he is standing directly over what they believe to be Peter's bones. And I mean directly over his grave. What they believe to be St. Peter's grave. We don't, we don't know that for sure, but they claim it is. He is standing directly over that when he says his mass. Their churches are full of dead men's bones. Exactly the way Jesus said in Matthew 23. Okay? They are whited sepulchers. And what that means is, they're the church of the second death. They are. Because they, and if you look in verse 15, I'll get to the point. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you compass sea and land. 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in this world. One seventh of the earth's population claims to be Roman Catholic. And they have compassed sea and land before anybody else could reach the new world with missionaries. The Catholic Church was sending priests, Jesuit priests, other priests over here to establish missions all over to bring these reprobate heathen and force them under the dominion of the Catholic Church. For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Think about what he said. When you're born once, you are born a child of hell. Because you're going just for being born. You were born in iniquity, fashioned and shapen in iniquity, the Bible says. There is no good thing in you. There is no righteousness. No, there is none righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So just by your birth and living in this world, I believe past the age of accountability, you already are going to hell. Period. The end. But he's saying here that because of what they teach and preach to people, causing them to believe it, that they become a twofold child of hell, meaning twice dead, I believe. Twice dead. And yes, don't ever give up on people. Don't ever give up on somebody. But there are some people, I don't know who they are, you don't know who they are, and they could be wearing, I'm a child of hell t-shirt. There might even be a rock group by that name. Sons of hell, something like that. I don't know. Hell's angels. Highway to hell. There's a good one. But they could be saved. But there are people, I have no doubt, in this world today, right now, who are already twice dead. They're already have been determined that they're going to the lake of fire. Um, this, I'm going to throw this in. This is the, the, the dessert. For the meal. Matthew chapter 4. Is the first place. First mention we have in the New Testament. Of the devil. When then was Jesus led up of the spirit. Into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now if you check. That phrase. The devil. 46 times. In your Bible. Now we mentioned a while ago. The number 23 is the number for death. So death times two, 23 times two is 46. And think of the devil. He is in charge. He is the prince of this world. He has the power of death. And this is the 46th occurrence of the phrase, the devil in your Bible. It's Revelation 20.10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. And what is the lake of fire? It's the second death. Isn't that neat how that works out? Post that one. Okay, 
46 times in your King James Bible, the devil's mentioned, 46 occurrence is when he is thrown into the lake of fire and that's the second death. That's your dessert. That's all you're getting today. Now, and then that may be all you're getting today. I don't know if I have any more notes after this. Let's go back to Revelation 2. Any questions on... Uh, in fact, no, do this. Turn to Matthew 25. Any questions on the second death, uh, the explanation of the difference between hell and the lake of fire? Um, and the, the question that some believe that... Thank you, I'll quit. But the question that some people still might have is, are people going to be conscious while they're in the lake of fire? Jesus addressed that. There are other verses that address it. Matthew, 20, or Matthew 25, verse um, 44, and we'll read down to verse 46. That's interesting. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And then he said, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. That is a eternal sentence of death. The punishment never stops. Who in here has ever been burned by something? Okay. Did you not get away from the fire as soon as possible? Why? Hurts. I can't think of anything hurts worse than fire. Okay. And I did this at camp one year. I'm going to count to 10. I want you to imagine just for a minute, for 10 seconds, that your whole body is on fire. And I'm going to start counting. Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then they put the fire out. How much damage has been done to your body? Are you still in pain? How long will that pain last? Long time. If hell and, and the lake of fire were for 10 seconds, it's enough for me to say, I don't want to go there. Being on fire, your whole body on fire for 10 seconds, quite possibly you'll have third degree burns and you're going to lose part of your skin. Anything beyond that will probably kill you. You probably, even if they get the fire out after 30 seconds, 30 sec just 30 seconds, if they get the fire out just after 30 seconds, you probably will not live. Probably will not. That's just 30 seconds. The lake of fire is forever. It is the second death. It is everlasting torture. Our brains can only process so much pain and then we go into shock. The purpose for the new body is to remove the restriction. So the brain or whatever your consciousness is, is processing all of the pain for eternity. I do not, I do not, there is nothing in this world worth going there. Nothing. Amen. Father, we ask for your blessings. Things like this are hard to talk about. We don't like to hear about it. We don't like to think about it. We ask for your grace. We thank you, dear God, for mercy. Father, we want to believe the right gospel. We want to believe the truth. We do not want to get this wrong. So we ask for your grace and your mercy in our lives, nothing else, to spare us from the second death. Bless those of us in the first resurrection. And thank you, God, that we're not appointed under your wrath. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said.
Amen.